Hi everyone, Anshita on the side. Welcome to AB Automation Hub. Today, we are not diving into any tools or code. Instead, I'm going to explain you the backend infrastructure and the essential API concept that power up the modern application behind the scene. When we test a login flow or when we verify any API response, there's a lot happening in the background. Things like API gateway, caching, load balancer, and even the message queues. So in this video, I will walk you through 10 key backend and API concepts. So whether you want to stay one step ahead or you just want to keep your fundamentals strong, then this video is definitely for you. Let's get started. The first topic in the list is microservices. It's an architecture style where the large application is broken into smaller independent services, each handling a specific functionality. Instead of building one monolithic application, that handle users, orders, payment, and inventory all in one code base. So you create separate, separate services for all of them. So each service has its own database and can run and deploy independently. All right. So what is the benefit of using microservices? If your payment service crashes, your user service will still work. So this is a sample diagram where you can see we have separate service for user service. You can create separate service for payment functionality and for the order service and each one of them have its own database also. Moving to the next topic, API Gateway. API Gateway, it's a server that acts as a single entry point for all the client requests to your system and forwards the client request to the right microservice and handle the tasks like authentication, rate limiting and the load balancing. So all the client requests go through this API Gateway first and then here it handles authentication rate limiting, load balancing, and then it redirects to the correct microservice. So instead of clients calling 10 different microservices directly, they call one API gateway, and then it is redirected to the correct microservice. Next topic in the list is rate limiting. One of the very famous topic, which is used when you're testing any API. So rate limiting, basically it's a technique used to control number of requests a client can make to a server within a specific period of time, and it helps to prevent overuse or abuse. For example, you set rules like 100 requests per minute per user, or 1000 requests per hour per API key. When the limit is reached, it returns port 29 status code, that means too many requests. So why it is used? Because it prevents the API abuse, it protects the server resources. If you see over here, we have this rate limiter, it is configured in a way which has 100 requests per minute. So if you have a user who is trying to access and he or she is making 10 requests or let's say 99 requests per minute, in that case, it will be allowed. But in case, if there's a bot or let's say spam user, which will hit your API for 200 requests per minute. In that case, that request would be blocked. Why? Right? Because we have a rate limiter setup over here, which only allows 100 requests per minute. So imagine using an ATM where you are allowed only three withdrawals per day. If you try a fourth time, the machine will say limit exceeded. So that's a rate limiting where you're controlling how many requests or actions you can make in a given time. The same thing we have tried to explain from this example also. Moving on to the next topic, which is CDN. CDN also known as Content Delivery Network. So it's a network of distributed servers that deliver static content like images, videos, CSS, JS, faster by serving it from the server, which is closest to the user. In this case, it will reduce in the server load and it will improve the overall user experience, especially for the global users. Imagine a movie is produced in Canada, but instead of everyone having to fly to Canada to watch it, copies are sent to your local theaters worldwide. Now you just go to your nearby theater and watch that movie. So that's what a CDN does for a digital content. So instead of every user making a long trip to the original server, maybe it can be Canada or US, CDN keeps that local copy near the users everywhere. So the access is fast and smooth. In this case, we have an origin server where the content is created and we have the edge server where we have content copied worldwide. So it can be accessed from the near server, not from the origin. So this is about content delivery network, which we also call it as CDN. Now moving on to the next topic, which is webhooks. So webhooks is basically a real-time notification 
that is sent from one application to another application whenever a specific event happens. So instead of constantly pulling an API to check for the update, the server automatically sends a request to a specified URL when something happens. So it's a real-time update. It reduces unnecessary API call and it is more efficient. If you just see over here, this is a sample diagram from the Zapier, which I've taken from Google. This is the example of Webo and this is the example of API. In the API with this, what happened? You send a request and then you get a response. You have to keep calling that API again and again. But in case of Webhook, there will be a real-time notification which will be sent whenever a specific event happened. So for example, you get a notification whenever your code is dispatched. There also Webhook is configured. And in case you have configured Webhooks like Slack notification or whenever any PR is merged into the master branch, you will get a notification in Slack. It can be done by configuring your Slack webhook. So this is the benefit of webhooks. Now moving on to the next one, which is message queue. Message queue is a communication method which is used to send, store, and retrieve messages between parts of an application or between different applications. So in this, what happens? Producer service add messages to the queue and the consumer services process them. So messages are handled asynchronously. So producers do not wait for the processing to complete. It just keep on sending message. For example, you go to any food court and place an order over there. Even if 100 customers show at once, the system will not crash. It will queue them up and serves at its own pace. So in software, whenever any service receives too many requests, it puts them in a message queue like RabbitMQ or Kafka, and the workers then process each message async whenever ready without overwhelming the whole system. This is a sample diagram for message queue where producer service keep on adding message to the queue and then whenever consumer is ready, it will start receiving the message and process. So that's about the message queue. So some of the famous and widely used tools for implementing message queue are RabbitMQ, Apache Kafka, and Amazon SQS, which is simple queue service. Now moving on to the next topic, which is caching. So caching is basically temporarily storing frequently accessed data. So it can be retrieved faster the next time it's needed. And it reduces the need to fetch it repeatedly from the original source. So for example, imagine a student who is asked what is the capital of China. The first time student will look it up in the book and say Beijing. But next time, since the student will remember the answer, he or she will reply instantly. So in that case, he or she does not have to look it up again. So here the memory acts as a cache for the answer. Similarly, on the web, your browser saves the things like images and page layout from the website you visit. The first visit loads these images from the internet, but on the next visit, your browser can show them from the local storage. So the page loads much faster and no need of repeatedly downloading the same files from the server. So this is a sample diagram where user once try to access this website and all the data is put in the cache memory. So next time when user try to access it, instead of going to the main database, it will fetch from this cache. It will go to this database. It will take 200 milliseconds. But here from the cache, it will get the response in just two milliseconds. So we have different types of cache. We have cache at the browser level and we have it at the database level. So for browser level, it keeps files locally. And in case of database cache, it will store the query results in the memory. So what is the benefit? It will reduce the server load and it this will make your response quite fast and efficient. Now the next topic in the list is load balancer, which is one of the very, very important topic. It distributes the incoming traffic across multiple servers to ensure no single server is overwhelmed or overloaded. So imagine you go to a busy restaurant which has several waiters. So instead of all customers crowding and waiting for one waiter, the host, which is load balancer, it directs new customers to a different waiter who has less table or who is less busy. So this way, no waiter will be overloaded and everyone would be and everyone would be served faster and smoothly. Same thing happened in the tech world also. So load balancer basically sends the first user to server one the second user to server B and third user to server C. 
and then it starts again from server A for the fourth user and so on. This way, the traffic is evenly spread, preventing any one server from being overloaded. So there are many algorithms. This is the example of round-robin algorithm. Other example is we have server A, which is currently handling five users. And we have server B, which is handling three users. And server C, which has two users. The load balancer sends the next user to server C because since it has the fewest active connection. So this is how load balancer works. It forwards a request to the next available server to ensure high availability and consistent performance. So this is what I have tried to explain it from this diagram in which let's say we have multiple clients accessing the application and we have load balancer over here. So this is about load balancer. Next topic is proxy. It's a server that acts as an intermediary between client and another server forwarding the request on the client's behalf. So just think of it like a middleman that keeps identities and systems hidden or filtered. So for example, if you're using a VPN, in that case, your request is going through a proxy server. So there are two types of proxy. One is forward proxy and the other is reverse proxy. For example, imagine you want to send a letter, but instead of sending it directly, you go to your trusted friend, which acts as a proxy here, who will send it for you. When the reply comes, it also goes to your friend first, who then gives it back to you. So this helps keeping your address private. So why we use proxy? Because it hides your real location. That is, let's say, IP address. It can block bad or unsafe sites. It can speed up your internet by saving copies of frequently accessed websites. So that's about proxy. This is the sample diagram in which client makes a request. So it goes via proxy. It does not go to the main server directly. We have proxy as an intermediary layer. So that's all about the proxy. Now the last topic is database sharding. It is a method of breaking a database into a smaller manageable pieces called shards to improve performance, scalability, and storage efficiency. So instead of one database table with 10 million users, it will create multiple shards. So in this case, instead of storing all the user data in single database server, which will just slow down the queries and eventually crash also under too much of data. Here, the data is divided into smaller chunks, which is called as shards. So shard one stores user with user ID one to 10,000. And similarly, we have shard two and shard three. So each shard is hosted on a different server. So when any application needs to fetch or update the data for let's say ID 11,000, so it will go directly to the shard two, not to all the shards and it will not put load on entire database. So in this way, it will reduce the load on each server and it will speed up the data operations. So instead of one overloaded server, the workload is basically spread across many servers. So each server can handle fewer users. So queries and updates are much faster in this case. This approach is widely used by big companies like Instagram, Uber, Amazon to manage millions of users efficiently. So this is about database sharding. So that's it for today's video. If you found it useful, please like, share and subscribe to my channel and drop a comment with your favorite concept. And thank you for watching AB Automation Hub.